This morning, I am reading from the Gospel of Luke, which is a little bit of a switch for us, because we've been in John for all of Lent, and even for the first two Sundays of Easter. But in this third Sunday of Easter, we're looking at resurrection from the eyes and the spirit of Luke. If you will, turn with me in your text to Luke, the 24th chapter. We're starting at the 13th verse and reading through 35. Or if you delight in just listening, listen to the words that are spoken from the holy text. Now on that same day, two of them were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests, and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and beside all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, They came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself and all the scriptures. As they came near to the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly saying, stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, he blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. When he was at the table with them, oh, I said that already. Then their eyes were open and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of God's word. I'd like to use as a sermonic theme this morning, the Emmaus Road a subtitle, A Visit from a Stranger. A Visit from a Stranger. With fondness, I recall my first day in Chicago. Even though I've been here some years, I'm actually a transplant. That means I wasn't born here, I wasn't raised here. 
My family had driven all of my stuff up on a truck. I mean, not an SUV, but a real truck. And we had arrived on a sunny summer day, Sunday afternoon. Here's the thing, I was coming to go to graduate school and they had given me a time of check-in on Monday morning. We had gotten here early, we drove around the campus of University of Chicago and everything appeared to close. Everything appeared to be closed. And so we wandered around driving and we ended up on a dead end road in front of Ida B. Wells, what was then called a housing high rise project, which is no longer standing today. And on that day when we ended up on a dead end road in front of Ida B. Wells housing project high rise, it looked or appeared to be a hundred kids outside running in every direction with the water hose spraying water in many directions. This was more excitement than we were looking for at the time. It was hot, we had driven for a long time, we were tired, and it seemed like this was the stuff we had seen on Crooklyn or in some movie, but never in person. I could feel my heartbeat beating faster. But every time I think, or every time I drive by this area, and this past week I was over in the area and it looks much different now, I think about my first day in Chicago. This is where we enter the biblical text this morning. We discover two disciples that after Jesus' death are on a journey themselves trying to get from point A to point B, Emmaus Village. Most of our lives, by the way, are spent on a journey. Most of our lives are spent going from one point to another, trying to get from one place to another. Even now, we are trying to get from present COVID-19 to making it through COVID-19. Some of us are staying at home as much as possible so that one day we can go out again and be amongst our friends. As urban dwellers, we're not only on a journey, but we often encounter strangers every day, which is merely to say this, we encounter people who we know nothing about. They are foreign to us. Our lives have not intersected. And sometimes we only know what we have seen on TV, heard in the news, or what has been shared across the dinner table in the intimacy of our home. So we find ourselves two disciples on a, route, on a, on a road, living between fear and faith, hurt and hope, lament and love, misery and ministry, pain and purpose. They are in the deep conversation, no social distancing going on here, as they lean into another because what they have to say is that important. It feels paramount. The world is a nut as they discuss the events of the past three days. They were on their way to Emmaus, the village, deep in discussion as this person, this stranger, approached them. I call it a visit from a stranger. The stranger inquires about their discussion. They look on with disbelief. You had to have heard about the murder of Jesus Christ. It's the talk of the town. It's on every news station. It's on every social media outlet. It's on every podcast. It comes up in every conversation. Jesus was the king of the kings and lord of lords. He was a prophet who performed miracles. He sat among those on the margins. He could tell you things about yourself you hadn't told anybody else. He was bruised, but bought healing. He was pierced, but eased pain. He was persecuted, but bought freedom. We had high hopes that this was the one that would redeem Israel. And they killed him. Where have you been? Have you been hiding under a rock? That's what we are talking about. In our culture, we are taught to be suspicious of the stranger. It's a lesson we teach to our kids. In my own coming of age story, I was raised, don't talk to strangers. Yes, we attempt to instill this in kids early on. Don't talk to strangers. Years ago on the Oprah show, they showed just how much this doesn't work when trying to train kids, people not to talk to strangers. They had three scenarios that took place in a park. 
with three kids who have been instructed and talked over and over again over the last couple of weeks, do not talk to strangers. They had the tapes rolling. They had a stranger come up to the kid, and at first the kid seemed a little bit pensive, but it didn't take long. All three kids walked right off the park grounds with the stranger. You see, we teach this fear of stranger in our culture, but when it comes down to crimes of passion and abuse, often they're done by people we know and are very familiar with. We not only teach a fear of strangers to our kids, but we teach it in our culture. We teach fear in our culture. Right now, we are so high. It's toxic with fear in our culture. We teach fear of Mexicans because they are criminals. We teach fear of black people because they are in gangs. We teach fear of Muslims because they are terrorists. We teach fear even now of Asians because they've got the virus. We teach fear of the LGBT people because they could sway our kids. When will we stop demonizing and labeling others? Those people, they, they, they are put at arm's length and yet we have a stranger in the midst, and they engage that stranger in conversation. There's little known about this person, but still the two disciples allow this stranger to enter their conversation. Something feels right about this stranger, and so they keep talking to him, which reminds us that you can have some amazing experiences in your life journey if you could just be open to a stranger. We keep putting up walls and fences and security systems and buying guns to keep folks out, when really if we would just get to know the stranger in our midst, they may not be so scary. In the new Netflix movie, Unorthodox, which is based on a true story about one young girl who leaves her Hasidic Jewish community where she has been taught to view the world and all of those not like her as dangerous, as a community that would kill her. But when she leaves her community and is questioned by strangers, she does not throw her ultra-conservative Jewish community under the bus. When people ask her, why did she leave? Was it because her community was so strict? She says, no, I left because God expected too much of me. We know that often it's not so much that God expects so much of us, but that people interpret God in such a way that it feels like God expects too much of us. She's eating a sandwich that a stranger bought. When she asks the stranger what's in the sandwich, The stranger informs her that it's ham. She begins to gag, knowing she's about to throw up. She runs to the bathroom in anticipation that she's going to throw up, and nothing happens. You see, she's been taught some things about the world. She's been taught some things about the stranger. And in that moment, she comes back and she realizes there's nothing wrong with the ham, and there's nothing wrong with the stranger. Strangers helped Jewish families during the Holocaust. Strangers helped slaves in the Underground Railroad. Strangers are creating sanctuaries across America. Strangers are capable of showing an insurmountable amount of love and compassion to others. And I believe in this COVID-19 era, we will see strangers that will rise to new capacities because not everybody goes low. Some people actually do go high. I'm sure if you reach, you've been touched, if you reach down into yourself and your experiences, you've been touched by a stranger. As quickly as they danced into your life, they danced out and expected nothing in return. In my own African-American culture, we are taught that strangers could be angels and that you should really treat everyone with respect because you never know who's in your midst. A visit from a stranger. 
Jesus was a carpenter. Jesus was a prophet. Jesus was the son of man. Jesus was our Lord and Savior. Jesus was heralded as the king of the Jews. He had earned a few titles in his lifetime. But here today, Jesus is a stranger. How odd that might seem. And it is in this role as stranger, he walks alongside two disciples, listening to their anguish, listening to their pain sympathizing with them in their situation. Not being known can be a gift for a stranger to offer. People are different when they don't know who you are. Recently, there's this show that has a celebrity in a car and you're riding with them. And so they did Alicia Keys. And so they had people get in the car with her. And as they were riding with her, they didn't realize who she was, and they would just be talking. And then when they realized, it was different. You see, people are different when they know your titles, when they know your name, when they know all that stuff that goes behind your name. But here was Jesus, not as Jesus. Here was Jesus walking along the disciples, with the disciples, as a stranger. People act different when they don't know who you are. There were no roots. They could walk and talk and talk leisurely and be up front with each other and even go on their separate ways at some point. But there was something about the presence of this man that soothed them. They couldn't put their finger on it, but they felt a familiarity in this man, and they ended up inviting him to share dinner. I met another pastor, and she was sharing that she has two sons, and with her youngest son, she does a meal once a month. She would take him anywhere she wanted to go, wherever he wanted to go, and he could eat. It was their bonding time. But she also found if she needed to have a harder, more difficult discussion, this was the time to have it. You see, she observed that when you share a meal with someone, they let their guards down. When you share a meal with something, there is something more conciliatory in the nature of that moment. And so she found it easier to get her son, her son to talk, to get information, and to get information out of him, and to get information in him over a meal. The disciples are sharing a meal. I'd like to call it the truly last supper. Here they are after a day of travel at their destination. They go in and get ready to eat. They're at the table and ready to eat. The stranger takes the bread, breaks it, and blesses the food. And then, and then, and then they remember where they know him from. They open their eyes and Jesus is gone. They saw the stranger as someone more than dangerous. They saw the stranger as someone other than someone that could harm them. The disciples, after all they had gone through, were wonderfully open to this stranger who they knew nothing about, who they encountered on a journey. Not all strangers are good, for sure, but certainly many more are not bad. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. Stay woke. <laughs> Today, I began with a story of my own move to Chicago and being overcome with fear by so many little small strangers. Even today, we are being fed a good diet of fear of others and being told what to think about them. That's scary because fear has never been our friend. And fear makes us do crazy things. Fear makes us do some really, really crazy things. So I end here today with one more story about a stranger. In her own memoir, A Walk Until Sunrise, our very own Jade Mays tells of a horrid teenage life that led her from her chaotic home to the streets. And in those streets, she met all kinds of folks exploding a young homeless girl for her body. It looked like she was going to die in those streets, and that certainly would have been terrible. It seemed like the streets had broken her, like she was on the threshold of never to return. We've seen that look on bodies. We've seen that look in face. We've seen people who have been broken never to return. 
All logic would say that she should not trust any stranger, and yet it was one more stranger that came along and offered her a place to stay. He gives her a place to stay in a small house in the back of his main house. He sets her up, makes sure she's comfortable, and tells her she can stay for as long as she wishes. He feeds her, and he's kind to her, and he expects nothing in return. And the safe home is hers while she heals and mends, while she cries and sleeps, while she tries to find a way to put pieces of her life back together. And day after day, there's no pressure on her to leave. She can continue to stay there, and she starts to see the sun. She starts to feel a little bit of hope. And finally, one day, she's ready to go. She's ready to return back to the world. He tells her to lose his information and never contact him. Had he done this for somebody else before? Would he do it again? A stranger in our midst. Some might call this stranger an angel. I'd nominate him for sainthood or maybe Jesus unrecognized. However you spin it, maybe you two can declare in this season of Easter, the Lord has been made known to you. He is light and love and he is our Lord. He's been made known to you. He is goodness and kindness and faithfulness. And yes, I see the Lord. He is righteous and holy and powerful. I recognize him. He is our savior and his mind is on us. And there is a burning in my heart. I see him. I see him. Some of us can say with the disciples, he is risen indeed. We have seen him. He's our Lord and Savior. He's our King of Kings. Emmanuel with us, and he is the stranger. We have seen Jesus this Easter. Amen. <laughs>